Now let's go back to my talk. FAI, what do we know and what do we still need to find out? I think um, I will not be able to completely cover that topic and please feel free or ask if I haven't covered something. Um, I only will give you my personal biased opinion, of course, but I hope that's of some value for you. I just um, talked about the study that we did in Switzerland, the prevalence of CHEM type of impingement. We found out that one out of four young individuals has a CHEM deformity, and every second has it if he has a low internal rotation. But of course, we are not the only ones who looked for that. If you look at different studies, and you can show there's a study here also by Goswick. Um, they looked at a big cohort of 3,500 individuals, but the age was 60 years, and we looked for 18 years old. So if you look at all these studies, most of the studies looked for older individuals. So the only young individuals we had here, the Reichenbach study, which I just showed, and one from Caprone. He's uh, working with Chris Peters in Salt Lake City, and they clearly could show that um, in asymptomatic uh, national college uh, football players, they had a very high prevalence of impingement deformities. So again, if you start out with impact sports very early in life, the prevalence is very high. But all these other studies showed that what we have just said, that the prevalence of chem FAI is about 20% in males, 5% in females. Um, again, a study by Paul Boulay from Ottawa, uh, published by Huck as the first author. Kang published that 33% uh, of females and 52% of males have at least one predisposing factor for femoral acetabular impingement. So if you look at x-rays, you will find these alterations all over. But we really don't know whether all of these go into arthritis. We know that all of them will not go into arthritis, and we have to pick those who are uh, at risk. We are also interested to understand the association between femoral impingement and osteoarthritis, and I showed you our work that we did in Switzerland, and there are, again, many other papers, and if I would update this table, this would be now two or three tables, because every month there's another paper published on that. Out of these um, two, four, six, eight publications, only two did not find an association between um, impingement deformities and osteoarthritis. All the other paper reported on these associations. Now, what do we know with respect to these field studies, the cross-sectional studies reporting on prevalences? We know that CHEM FAI is rare, less than 5% in females, frequent, in, uh, frequent in males. Pinzer deformities, that means if you have an acetabular overcoverage, you find a little bit more frequent in females than in males. We also do know, but there's only one study on that, or maybe some more that I don't know of, <coughs> from Pollard out of the UK, showing that there's a familiar clustering of FAI. That means if one patient has it in a family, or if the parents have it, or, or the sisters or brothers, you are at a higher risk to also develop that. Um, and we clearly see more and more that impact athletic activities are so associated with FAI and potentially later damage to the hip joint. Now, with respect to the longitudinal studies, there are associations between impingement morphologies, but chem-type deformities, and that's important, are much more aggressive and harmful to the joint than pincer deformities. And this, we believe, is the reason why males get earlier arthritis than females. Now, what do we know about clinical outcomes of our treatment? If you go into PubMed, you will find many papers. Um, here you can only see uh, four systematic reviews published within the last couple of years. The first one here is by the group of Brian Kelly. I cited him earlier already on the management of label tears and femoral acetabular impingement of the hip in young active patients. Um, there's a paper here by, by Clohesi, John Clohesi. He's working in St. Louis, very active, performed also a systematic review. And here a paper 
by the group of Benjamin Domp and Mark Philippen and uh, Dean Matsuda. Both are arthroscopists. Most of these papers at the moment are published by arthroscopists. And I would say there's a mild bias to say that arthroscopy is better than open surgery. And none of these papers has, have shown that, really. And there is a, another paper that I will show you um, that clearly says both methods can provide you with the same results of course, dependent on the quality of surgery. Now, if you look for the success rate of open and arthroscopic surgery, in all these publications that are summarized in these systematic reviews, there is a success rate described, but what means success? Between 65 and 96 percent, is it that you don't get a total hip, or is it that you're a little bit better than before, or is it that you're much better be than before? So all of these successes are rated with different rating systems. And there's clearly no information available on OA progression um, after surgery and whether we can influence OA progression by surgery. We in Switzerland also asked our patient, what's the reason to undergo impingement surgery? Yesterday we have heard that sports is a number one reason. Yes, that's true for the athlete who makes his money with that, but I'm not so sure whether that's true also for the normal person living in Switzerland. And we had a slightly different results out of this study. Uh, we found that the most frequent top reasons to undergo surgery were allevi alleviation of pain, so pain was the number one reason. Uh, being indicated in 33% uh, of patients, 20% choose fear of worsening. They thought if it's getting even worse, that this was the number one reason. Improvement of uh, activities of daily living. And only uh, reason five was improvement in sporting activities. So in, it depends a little bit at what population you're looking at. And we looked at a normal population and not as an athlete population. But you also have to always keep in mind the clinical outcomes depend on how you measure it. And feeling better not always means feeling good. We hear that surgeons are reporting an improvement of the Harris hip score from 85 to 92. This means a significant improvement. But the patient say, I'm still, I still have pain. I can't play this, so I'm not satisfied with my data or with my results. So you have to keep in mind when you read all these papers, not everything what seems to be successful is also successful for the patient. And it depends really how you report on your outcomes. So what do we know today? We do know that structural deformities are frequent on imaging studies and can lead do not necessarily lead to hip damage. We also do know that surgery can relieve pain and resumption of activities of daily living and sports, but not in all of our patients. And success certainly depends on how you measure it. Better not always means really feeling good. Now what we still have to find out is what's really the impact of our treatment on the natural course that means on the development of osteoarthritis in these patients. Now, this is here a picture of a young uh, man, 24 or 5 years of age. He was working in Macklingen. This is a Swiss uh, s sports center like here. He is a um, skier and biker. But if you look at this x-ray, I mean, everybody says, yeah, he has here a femoral head neck junction problem. We would call this a chem type deformity. He has here something close to the acetabular rim, maybe a rim fracture and also acetabuli. And for those who are orthopedic surgeons, you might even see here a little bit this alteration within the bone. And when they perform an arthro MRI to allow us better to look into this joint, you can see that this young gentleman has severe damage with this large cyst and the main weight bearing zone, this rim fracture hypersclerosis. So his hip is already going a little bit downhill. And now the question is, can we stop the development of osteoarthritis? Can we make this hip last longer? Can we only alter the, the pain of this patient? 
So the question is, can we alter the natural course? And I looked into the literature because if I look at my patients, I don't have a prospectively randomized trial, so I really can't say that I can address this question. But if you look into the literature, if you look back for this hierarchy of evidence, all of you know that, I guess. Uh, the strength of evidence is Im increasing from expert opinion. This is what I give you at the moment. It's my personal opinion to case reports, cohort studies, randomized controlled trials. They are always difficult in orthopedic surgery. They're a little bit easier, I think, in, in, in general medicine, systematic reviews. And if you look now into what's known about the effect of surgical intervention, there are no controlled trials. There are no long-term studies. Long-term means more than five years on impingement. And the only thing which is available are case series. There's been very recently out of HSS a study, a prospectively randomized study comparing labor resection versus labor refixation. But uh, this is also not a very strong controlled trial. So we have really a big lack of information whether our surgery is good and we have to keep that in mind also in, um, in when our patients are counseling us to give them advice what to do. Now the most recent systematic review that I have in this presentation is by Papalia. I guess this is out of, out of Italy, this paper. Um, they uh, were interested, again, to compare arthroscopic and open surgery for the treatment of the um, uh, femoral acetabula impingement management, and they looked uh, into different databases. And what they found is, and I hope you can read this small table, I can explain this a little bit. Um, here is the modified Harris hip score. We heard yesterday is still the most widely used score even to assess um, hips which are not arthritic. Uh, in 10 publications here on the um, hip arthroscopy and in four publications for open surgery, these scores were used. You can see the baseline score and the end score had, a had a both a significant improvement. We don't know whether these patients all were happy, but we had a significant improvement, which were approximately the same whether you did it open or arthroscopically. Here you have the impression that the arthroscopy is a little bit better. If you look here for those studies who used the WOMEC, it's an arthritis score. It looked that open surgery was a little bit better than arthroscopy. And if you look here for the uh, non-arthritic hip score, I think it's, I, it's hard for me also to read. Uh, there were only few papers on that. Now it's here, here's the non-arthritic hip score. It's only uh, for arthroscopy and the Mealdobinier score, I mean, the, these studies are not very strong because the Mealdobinier score is a really arthritic score. But if you compare open and arthroscopic techniques, both reveal you quite similar results. And now, if you, if you look what they concluded in their paper, they said the progression of osteoarthritis and conversion to total hip replacement are dependent on, pre -op on the preoperative status of cartilage and osteoarthritis and type of management. That's clear. The more arthritic hips are, we know that from other childhood diseases, the worse is the outcome. Debridement of osteophytes provide um, better results than debridement al alone. Uh, debridement and osteoplasty, that means chem decompression. So only taking the labrum away, they also showed, does not add a lot for these hips. So you need to address the underlying um, pathology. And the conclusion is also open and minimally invasive procedures allow athletes to return to professional sport activity. They are contraindicated in patients with severe osteoarthritis and cartilage degeneration. With respect to the treatment of the labrum, we discussed that yesterday. Um, 25, 30 years ago, meniscal tears were treated by meniscectomies. Um, we did a systematic review, Lisa Tiber, a fellow of mine and myself, on label resection uh, versus label preservation during impingement surgery. And we found in this paper that label refixation appears to have a slightly better outcome. Slightly means pain-wise in the beginning, but I'm sure that these hips will last longer than those we'll take out um, the labrum. Now, with respect to revision, 
after hip arthroscopy, we do know if you don't address in impingement cases the underlying bony deformity, this is the number one reason that surgeons have to go back into these cases. This has been shown by two different publications. Now to summarize, can we reverse the natural history? Where are we at the moment? Unfortunately, we have a very low level of evidence provided by the current literature. We do think that labor reconstruction is better than labor resection. You would assume that, and it seems to come out from these not very well designed studies. And pre-existing arthritis and unaddressed structural deformities clearly predispose to failure. Where do we need to go? I think we have to develop optimal selection criteria for surgery. We not, should not do on everybody who has one or two signs of impingement on an MRI and a little bit of pain surgery. We also have to work on risk factors for clinical failure. We have also uh, to develop parameters for deformity correction. Impingement surgery is not impingement surgery. Somebody might do a good job, somebody might not do a good job. We need to work on the incidents and characteristics of associated complications. If you do a small surgery uh, with a low complication rate, it might be easier indicated than a big surgery with a high complication rate. And we need to understand the role of adjunctive, uh, adjunctive surgical procedures. Thank you. <laughs>